Swayam Prabha. Digital India. Educated India. Welcome to all of you in this last lecture of this course. So, uh, I am Dr. Ruchi Shri, I teach at uh, Bhagalpur University and uh, this course on democratic processes and social movements, so far you had 19 lectures. Uh, so, beginning with the democracy in India, how it has its institutional aspect as well as it has uh, different kinds of say. Uh, organizational structures which uh, carry forward this notion of democracy in India. And other than that, you also studied about development processes which was linked with social movements. So, so far you have studied about numerous social movements in India starting from say uh, work, working class movement to peasants movements, environmental movements, women's movement. And now we come to the end of this course and today uh, this lecture is titled as anti-corruption movements and uh, in the recent days, uh, not recent I should say because now it is almost more than 10 years that Anna Andolan was held and uh, that led to the formation of Aam Admi Party. <coughs> so uh, this case study of uh, Anna Andolan is actually very interesting to see how sometimes social movements may lead to formation of political parties. So, we will reach to that point little later, but uh, this, uh, this lecture I have designed in such a way that you will first get to know about what is corruption, what all are the consequences of corruption and why do we have anti-corruption movements or say a developing country like India, what kinds of problems does it face vis-a-vis -vis corruption. So this first slide that I have titled as corruption and introduction, let me tell you that corruption is a word that we use which we commonly use in our day to day practice. So, it is a word which is used in everyday language. So, in that sense how do we define corruption? Because corruption is something that in our minds the moment we listen about corruption then be it political corruption or say corruption in administration different kinds of notions of corruption comes to our mind. So, uh, Actually, it was Joe Biden, which was 47th Vice President of America, who said that corruption is just another type of tyranny. So, he, uh, he compares it with tyranny and tyranny is something tyrannical government rule. So, sometimes when something is wayward or something which is not the way it should be. So, in that sense corruption is equated with a kind of a cruel practice because uh, people have to pay undue money for getting some kind of service. In order to get the works done in lesser time, we end up paying bribe. So, these are the things which we usually uh, come across very often in India. So, corruption in public life is a means of obtaining personal benefit through illicit means and the abuse of public office and property. So, let me first underline the terms one is personal benefit. So, most of the times corruption has this that someone the one who is corrupt or who is getting into the corrupt practice. So, if he will uh, money or something for doing some kind of service then that is uh, that will be something which we say getting the bribery. So, personal benefit is one thing, then how? Through illicit means, means that is not legal. For example, if a form has to be filled and we need to pay 10 rupees for that and somebody asks us that see now you won't get this form that easily, you have to pay me 15 rupees because only I have this form. So that means you ended up paying 5 rupees extra. So that means that person has actually taken 5 rupees extra from you which became his personal benefit. Then he is abusing the public office because that form that you are going to fill will actually be part of some kind of institutional structure. So 
you could have easily got that in just 10 rupees but you ended up paying 15 rupees because that person in a way threatened you or he told you that you cannot get it for 10 rupees and only I have this form. So what will you do? You have no choice. So you, you paid 15 rupees. But suppose there is a mechanism when you can go and complain against him. Let's see the form's price is just 10 rupees but he is asking me for 15 rupees. So that kind of uh, mechanism for complaint should be there where if anyone is uh, involved into corrupt practices then about that person we can actually complain. So it leads to a kind of abuse or we can even use the word misuse of public office and property. So what does it lead to? So integrity, transparency and fight against corruption, they should be part of culture. So when we say the term culture, then culture tells us about a larger whole, means a society has a culture. For example, in India, we have this culture of like, if we have to get our works done in lesser time, we end, we end up paying bribe. So here, the one who took the bribe, it's certainly uh, the one who is a wrongdoer because he asked for bribe. But equally responsible is the person who paid that bribe. So you, you did not have that margin of time, something that was to be done in say 5 days, but you kept relaxing and it was only on the last day that you realized that oh I need to get it done. And then what you do is that, okay, I have to pay 200 rupees extra, fine, I'll just get it done. So in that sense, it is about two parties. One, the person who is corrupt and the other person who is promoting corruption by paying bribe to that person. So in that sense, it is the integrity, integrity of the person and uh, the transparency. This, the system should have a kind of transparency. If the transparency will be missing, suppose there is a rule and regulation when somebody gets into uh, corrupt practices, so that person may even, uh, for instance, if the, fill, if the form is to be filled, he may just do the back door entry. That fine, even if the door is, uh, even if the date is over, I will take the form from you. You give me some extra money, and we also think that okay, fine. If he is still allowing us to give, then let us pay some money. So that is how corruption becomes a culture. So if has to be if it has to be stopped, then both the parties, like the person who is paying the bribe, will also be uh, someone who has to stop this culture. So India as a country needs to fight with corruption in a major way if it has to become a world leader, because India's image that here corruption is so prevalent, it's something that is that is considered worldwide. So that image of India as a country that corruption is so high and uh, in the later phase we will be learning about some, some more facts and figures which will tell you how difficult is the situation in India. Now moving on to the next slide, I have here summarized about corruption in India. So while in the previous slide we were actually dis discussing the definition of corruption or what could be the different ways of interpreting corruption. Let us here see what is the level of corruption in India. So India ranks 78th position in 180 countries. So this was done, a, a global corruption index was made in 2018. This global corruption index of 180 countries worldwide, India is at the 78th place. So I am sure that you can understand that India still needs to improve it quite a lot. So India has a long way to go for, for being a corruption free country. So that is something for which India will have to stepwise work upon and later on also when we will see about the different types of corruption, then we will realize that we need to work on different fronts. So one of the biggest curses that India is suffering, these are the words that I am reading to you. Uh, they are the words of Muhammad Ali Jinnah and you must have heard of Jinnah. Uh, Jinnah was the person who in a way you can say proposed this two nation theory and India and Pakistan ended up becoming two separate nations. So he considered that corruption is one of the biggest problems in India, one of the biggest curses. And I am not saying that other countries are free from it, but I believe 
our situation is much worse is bribery and corruption so bribery the culture of bribery and that leads to corruption in the society so he further says that corruption is a poisonous substance means it is like a poison a poison which leads to you can say the entire society is undergoing that so these words way back in 1947 tells us that even at the time of independence corruption was something which was so prevalent in india as per a research conducted by transparency international let me tell you that transparency international is a civil society organization which prepares the data regarding corruption etc it uh, even global corruption index kind of thing they use the data given by transparency international so in the in this one of the reports in 2005 it said that there are more than 62% indians who have paid a bribe to a public official at some point in their lives that means transparency international conducted the interviews of say they must have conducted it for hundreds and thousands of people and they came across this they, their data says that more than 62% people have actually paid bribe so in india paying bribe is not something which is unusual you whomsoever you will ask they will say oh acha in this kind of circumstance i ended up paying a bribe so sometimes for filling a form or for sometimes get, getting a gas connection or for sometimes the entry into hospital so at any point you may have to pay bribe of different kinds now uh, another report from 2008 found that about half of indians had first hand experience of paying bribes or using contacts to get services from government agencies so uh, if you have to get the work done then either you should know someone there so if you have a connection some kind of connection you know someone through someone then that makes your task easy or say even for paying the bribe uh, you will get a kind of concession so if you know someone then if others have to pay 1000 rupees you may have to pay just 800 rupees and you will be happy about it that oh i could save my 200 rupees because i knew that person so that kind of a culture is something so prevalent in india and uh, that's how uh, like corruption is so deep seated in indian society now let's talk why corruption what are the causes of corruption so some of the key causes or some of the main causes are as following it is a result of unbridled greed and increased market competitiveness like see all of us people are interested in becoming richer so suppose the salary is 10000 rupees and if by taking bribe etc they can earn 5000 extra then people will be interested in that extra 5000 rupees because you are the 10000 that you are getting as salary is not enough because of the uh, you know the pressure of market or the way things have become much more expensive then there is a low level of education among the large section of population so what happens is that sometimes people just do not know about the rules and regulation that they can get their work done without paying bribe and they feel that oh if the thing can be done easily if if i don't have to go through the paperwork on my own it's better to just pay money so what happens is that for getting your aadhar card done or for making your passport we end up paying extra money to whom we say the middleman or the dalal and that is a way that is the way how corruption functions so the government officials have a certain kind of channel through which in between there is middleman and people can get their works done then the third point is that there is a degrading ethical and moral values so if if there will be a decline of moral values then people will not think so much about that this is not something that we should do so this difference between should whether we should pay a bribe or not should and should not so certainly those who are asking for bribe they should not but what about those who are paying so even they should not pay so that is the whole logic that there is those who pay and then those who take this is a kind of cycle
and that's how corruption flourishes people willing to use corrupt tactics tactics to achieve their goals so what happens is that people want to get their work done easily and they and end up being into the this kind of corrupt practices then people who engage in corrupt practices such as receiving or offering bribes that leads to black money so it uh, there will be black money in the society then there will be use of unlawful means means you move away from law you uh, you get even the uh, such activities done which are not legal so uh, these are the two major problems one the increase in black money and second the unlawful practices being promoted let us now discuss let's now analyze the causes of corruption so here we discussed about causes of corruption but they were in general and here i have further divided them into four types so we are going to talk about the typology of corruption uh, in terms of the reasons or causes so when we talk about the political reasons then there is use of black money in elections now how the black money is used in elections because most of the political parties they receive money or you can say funding from the companies or sometimes even the people who are rich the money lenders etc so the black money is something which is used in abundance in india so that is one way of uh, how the political corruption happens in india second is criminalization of politics that most of the people who contest election they have a kind of criminal background either they have gone to jails or they have some cases which are there against them so they have some fir's laws against them so these are something which are very common in india and uh, in fact uh, you will be surprised to know that more than 40% of our uh, political leaders have some or the other kind of criminal background some may have some minor uh, um, the minor cases some even have the major cases so that is the second point so first was use of black money and second is criminalization of politics and third is the capitalist nexus what is capitalist nexus means the coming together of the politicians and the businessmen so the politicians uh, they promise the businessmen that if we come to power then we will have the lenient rules for you we will get your works done easily and similarly it is the businessmen who give money to the political parties so that is how the interest of these two the vested interests of the politicians and businessmen they end up coming together so that is actually for the flourishing of capitalism which is the larger uh, logic how will capitalism flourish so for that the politicians and the businessmen they end up coming together so these are the three political reasons that i have cited here then coming to the economic reasons there is a high share of informal sector so in india instead of formal sector we have the informal sector and there the rules and regulations are not that strict so what happens is that people end, end up doing getting into corrupt practices then second point i have mentioned which is also linked to the first one only is the ease of doing business for instance if you have to get a license for something or if you have to set up an industry then if you go through the proper channel means going through the uh, procedural aspect applying for it in the government office etc that will take you a very long time but if you go for say the middlemen who have all the paperwork they have the channel they will tell you that we will get this work done in 10 to 15 days for you but you have to pay this much of money for you so obviously instead of going for that long procedure which may take you 2 to 3 months or this is also possible that you will not be able to do it on your own the the cumbersome process of paperwork that you will just end up you find it easier to pay money so in terms of the ease of doing business to get any permit or sometimes say even to get your driving license made or to get a chalan for something these are the things which we end up paying money for 
so that leads to a kind of high inequalities so those who are easily making money uh, for something that they should not be paid it leads to a huge kind of inequality in the society so these are the economic reasons now coming to the administrative reasons what are the administrative causes there is a pattern of colonial bureaucracy what is colonial bureaucracy that most of the laws that, that we have be it say indian penal code i am unable to okay indian penal code ipc i hope some of you must have heard of indian penal code it is about what will be the process of punishment this came in 1860 similarly the rule regarding the police reforms act so be it police or uh, say the legal things most of the things in india have a colonial background so we have a colonial hangover so we used to call the britishers as my bap that they are like our father and mother and that same culture continued so even today uh, those who are powerful in the society powerful in the sense if somebody has uh, a vehicle which is given by the government or say those who are the district magistrates or the judges then people have this kind of tendency that they consider them as god so what has happened is that it, uh, a lot of corruption has led to failed reforms so reforms in india is not something that is uh, happening the way they should be and it has led to low wages so whatever should be actual uh, payment to the people sometimes they are paid lesser than that so that is also there then there is judicial failure so sometimes even the court cases they get delayed uh, to a very long time so that's also something which is caused by corruption and the last point that i have mentioned is the social and ethical reasons so for instance one is the changes in lifestyle so lifestyle everyone wants to have much more luxurious life people want to have ac and car and maybe two to three houses so to have the things that are not there in your uh, legal income that you have then you you try to practice the illegal things so illegal practices will lead to corruption and this is also one of the reasons then there is social discrimination that in the society those who are richer those who have earned money even if through unfair means we do not ask by what means somebody is getting richer and richer you must have seen a lot many data about say scams or different kinds of corrupt practices so these are the things which are important to understand that there there are ethical reasons which are there and the last point is that the failure of moral education system so morality is something that tells us what we should and what we should not and uh, mostly to the kids to the to the children we teach that we should speak, speak the truth or we should not lie uh, or that uh, we should pay respect to those who are elders things like these which are part of moral education they become just uh, what to say uh, just a kind of formality because in the real life we do not practice them and as a result we end up getting into the corrupt practices so we all know that this is not correct to do or this is not ethical but when it will come to doing then if it is easily available then people end up doing that so these all are the different kinds of reasons and i have summarized these reasons as political reasons economic reasons administrative reasons and social and ethical reasons so i hope that you have now a, a fair idea that uh, in indian society how does corruption function in such a you can say it had such widespread kind of a notion in india so the so far we talked about the causes now let us see what does it lead to what all are the impacts that it has so no wonder in one line we do understand that it is not good for the society it leads to inequalities or it leads to black money etc let us first summarize these points one that it increases inequality in the society 
so those who are corrupt they will be getting richer in a less amount of time so if by just their legal means if they will take 10 years to earn that much of money by being corrupt they can easily make that much of money in just one or two years so what will it lead to it will lead to inequality second point is that it discourages investment in business and trade so since it is very difficult to do business so that way due to corruption people are not interested in investing in india so for instance in uh, in the indian society uh, the foreigners they are not that willing to invest money here in indian market so that limits the economic growth due to india's image of being a corrupt country our economic growth also goes down then it undermines the fairness of government institutions so what happens is that we have this notion that if we go to the government offices it will take us long time to get the work done or how difficult it is to get the works done in government offices so the fairness we we do not consider them as fair next is the enjoyment of human rights gets curtailed so what what is the due of everyone that should be easily available to the people it's something for which they have to go through the same the illegal channels we have to uh, we have to get those things things like say aadhar card passport driving license these are the things for which we end up paying to the middlemen because that channel the the correct means is something that takes either too long or we are unable to do that so that is that's how human rights is something that is curtailed then there is misallocation of the talents so talents in the society whoever should be at whichever place sometimes if somebody else gets for example when somebody is corrupt then suppose somebody took the bribe and gave that seat or that employment to someone who was not fit for that so suppose uh, for a place like Bihar, we often get to hear this that there will be such kinds of malpractices when it comes to uh, say whenever there is vacancy of posts like clerks, teachers or uh, even uh, the guards then people pay say 1 lakh, 2 lakhs and they get the seat. So what happens is that sometimes those who could have come through the fair means those who are uh, more competent for uh, competent for those posts they will not get it but rather they will get it who have paid that bribery of say 1 lakh or 2 lakhs so that that is what the point is the misallocation of talents next is the loss of tax revenue so corruption also uh, leads to loss of tax revenue because sometimes uh, people show their uh, their income as pretty less there are ways of doing things and that leads to tax revenue or sometimes even uh, people get their things done in an incorrect manner so these are the things which are uh, not good for the tax regime of India then there is that all these things lead to adverse budgetary allocations so in terms of making the budget sometimes whichever sector should get whatever amount that is also something where there we find a kind of mismatch so these all are the points that tell us how negative are the impacts of corruption in the Indian society. Now we move on to the movements. What are the anti-corruption movements in India? So this one I have divided into two parts. I have primarily talked about two social movements or say two anti-corruption movements. One is the JP movement. Jayaprakash Narayan, he led the movement which we call as total revolution. And the second is the movement led by Anna Hajare. So these are the two primary anti-corruption movements. So, so far we have studied about corruption as a concept. Then we did causes of corruption. Then we did the negative impacts of corruption. We looked at some of the facts and figures around India as a country, how corrupt India is considered worldwide. So these are the things which gave us a backdrop that corruption as a problem is something which is so deep seated in India. Now let's move on to the anti-corruption movements. So there is this existence of a self-perpetuating cycle of corruption. What is self-perpetuating cycle? 
सेल्फ परपिचुएटिंग इज वेन समथिंग कीप्स गोइंग ऑन ऑन इट्स ओन और समथिंग दैट कीप्स रेप्लीकेटिंग इट सेल्फ सो समथिंग इज हैपनिंग इन द सोसाइटी एंड द नेक्स्ट जेनरेशन ऑल्सो लर्नस फ्रॉम दैट एंड देन द सेम प्रैक्टिस आर अगेन एंड अगेन कैरीड फॉरवर्ड दैट इज सेल्फ परपिचुएटिंग फॉर इंस्टेंस my father paid 100 rupees extra to someone in order to get the work done i learnt about it so in my consciousness that is there so whenever the need is then i will also pay i'll say that oh even my father had to pay so i know that this is something which is the culture so it is a kind of self perpetuating cycle that we do not question it and we just let it happen we just let it uh go on in the society so what happens is that it has been carried over since years so in india uh we the indian society we have become so used to of corrupt practices we do not question and we just become because it was there since the british uh period so it was during the british rule itself also that the corrupt practices were there when politicians and bureaucrats expected under the table payments that's what we call it that something that is not seen and nowadays you must be aware that everywhere cctv camera is being put that the people should not be uh, taking bribe or people should not be paying bribe so if there will be cctv camera then it will ensure a kind of transparency that no just this feeling that you are under under the cctv surveillance that people do not get into such practices but earlier in the pre cctv days such things were pretty uh, prevalent or even during the british days so what happened is that in india anti corruption struggles were initiated in 1971 74 here i have mentioned numerous years because these all are the instances of say small movements or big movements we will primarily talk about Two one nineteen seventy four is the JP movement, and two thousand eight is the Anna movement. But why all these other years? Is because in these all years also, the small scale anti-corruption movements. were taking place at different parts of india so we should know that it was gradually building up so what was happening in 1971 1974 77 it had its impact even after 30 years and when anna andolan happened when anna started that movement he himself said that he had the impact of or he was influenced by jp partly by jayaprakash narayan and also by gandhi so whenever we talk about gandhi and jp then it is about ensuring the ethical values in indian politics so let's discuss that uh, it was the kind of an unrest regarding the policies that were made in india and there was the kind of the, the, these anti corruption movements were demanding that there should be strict anti corruption measures which should be taken up so mostly in say things like bureaucracy judiciary and even legislature these are the places where uh, be it the officers who are corrupt at times the bureaucrats are corrupt sometimes even the politicians are corrupt and sometimes even in judiciary even the judges they can be corrupt so the corruption is something which is everywhere be it bureaucracy be it judiciary be it uh, legislature and that's why if we want to fight corruption then it has to be fought at every scale so at different levels we need to fight it jagdeep chokar he is a founding member of association for democratic reforms now let me tell you that this adr this is a civil society organization an ngo this ngo has played an important role in bringing the data regarding corruption in india 
the level of corruption in India, especially regarding the politicians and the bureaucrats. So, this organization has said that we have been fighting criminals ruling the roost for a long time. This just happened to be a stark display for the world to see. So, they say that we bring up the report so that the whole world gets to know that how deep seated is corruption in Indian society. So, the data brought by them is something that let me tell you it is a continuation of the previous slide. They have brought a report that nearly a fourth of 540 parliament members they face criminal charges. So, out of all these parliament members 25 percent of them face criminal charges. What kind of criminal charges? Human trafficking one, immigration rackets, embezzlement, rape, even murder. So, as heinous as all these you can say they can be considered as even the sins like they are something for which the entire society feels so bad if our politicians have such criminal background. So, ADR has brought these reports and now worldwide India has an image that corruption is so much so there. So, in India corruption goes beyond an individual level and it can be found in almost every institution. So, here we have reached to a crucial point one is individual and two is institutional. So, corruption is not just an individual thing that one person taking bribe or one person paying bribe, but it is also at the entire institutional level if we find it in judiciary or if we find it in the police. So, sometimes suppose you are caught on a red light, then if you pay 200 rupees to the person, then that person will not make. So, that is why that point I was saying that it leads to loss of tax revenue. If it had to go through the proper channel, then maybe that money will go to the government. But here, if the police himself took some money from you, that means the money did not reach the government. It became his personal gain. So, in that sense, it needs to be curbed under the law for the smooth functioning of the system. So, what happens is when it is at the institutional level, sometimes you will even get to know that there is a proper channel that if uh, uh, there are say 10 officers in one police station, then everyone will have a commission that if one work is to be done and that police station got say 1000 rupees or 2000 rupees, then who will get what there is a share of the income that how much money will go to whom. So, as per the ADR report, it was in 2019 elections, the recent Lok Sabha elections, 43 percent of the winners had declared criminal cases against themselves and 29 percent had declared serious criminal cases such as murder, attempt to murder, kidnapping and crimes against women. So, now these two data. 43 percent of the winners had declared criminal cases against themselves. So, nowadays what happens is that whenever some leader has to fight the election, then he has to declare two things, one about their criminal charges and second the amount of property that they have, property of even the spouse. Suppose if the husband is going to contest, then he has to also declare how much money the wife has. So, in that sense this criminal background and the amount of money that a person has these two things are declared. But here we see that a huge amount of say if 30 percent people had serious criminal charges and 43 had some small charges or, or the big charges. So, it is not a very happy kind of situation that in India we have a large amount of the numerous political leaders who are corrupt in India. Let us now discuss about JP movement or what we also call as total revolution. So, Jayaprakash Narayan was a socialist leader who is popularly known as JP. He started the total revolution and total revolution we also call Sampurna Kranti. It was a confluence of sorry S is missing was a confluence of his ideas of seven revolutions. So, it is also called Saptakranti because seven revolutions at the same time, Sapta Kranti, 
seven revolutions. So what were those seven revolution? One, it is social, two, economic, three, political, four, cultural, fifth, ideological and intellectual together, five, six is educational and seven is spiritual. So JP was of the view, Jay Prakash Nayan said that the society needs to undergo a revolution in which these seven revolutions should go on together. Then only we will be able to fight the corruption which is so prevalent in Indian society. JP was not very rigid regarding the number of these revolutions. So he was saying that they may often get interlinked. For instance, here we have clubbed ideological and intellectual. They may be bifurcated also. Similarly, here spiritual or educational. So he was saying that the seven revolutions could be grouped as per the demands of social structures in a political system. So he was saying that in a different setup, we may need different understanding that if it is an educational institution, then there the reforms in education will be needed if it is a social institution. So as per the context, we have to think that what do we need to do. So here onwards, the idea of total revolution became so popular in 1974 and it even led to say Gujarat. So he started this movement in Bihar, but its impact was felt in Gujarat and Maharashtra as well. So one thing that JP attacked on was corruption and second was inflation that the price rise which was there. So uh, in his address in, uh, on 5th June in 1974, he said, this is a revolution, a total revolution. This is not a movement merely for the dissolution of the assembly. We have to go far, so far. So he was aiming at a society which will be totally free from corruption. And let me tell you here that uh, total revolution was one of the biggest reasons that emergency uh, was declared in India. Because Indira Gandhi government was in a way, uh, uh, she had this fear that there can be total abolition, that the government can be outthrown. So due to that, the emergency was declared. So now what was the character of total revolution? So he said that total revolution is a permanent revolution. It will always go on and keep on changing both our personal and social lives. This revolution is something that is likely to change the entire society. So this revolution was aiming at a political change, social change, economic, cultural, educational, spiritual, all these different kinds of changes had to go hand in hand with each other. So he was calling the workers to come together as well as the farmers, students, women. So different sections of the society, the weaker sections of the society, especially JP was calling them to join the movement. And thus in that sense, it became the total revolution. Now this slide I have mentioned as JP's attack on corruption. JP was deeply disturbed by the growth of corruption in the Indian political system. He said, I know politics is not for saints, but politics at least under a democracy must know the limits which it may not cross. So the politician should also limit, uh, should also remain in a limit that is something which was underlined by him. He also declared JP, declared his people's charter means we need to consider the larger sections interest. So he was saying that so far the way Indian democracy is functioning, it looks like that it is in favor of the elite section of the society. So he said corruption is eating into the vitals of our political life. It is disturbing development, undermining the administration and making a mockery of all laws and regulations. It is eroding people's faith and exhausting their proverbial patience. So what happens is that people lose patience and they come forward to oppose such kinds of acts. So corruption, how deep seated it is, was underlined by JP. Now let's move on to Anna movement because I told you in great detail about JP movement 
and as I had told you in the beginning that we are going to do two movements. We have done JP movement and now we will learn about Anna movement. So Anna Hajare called for the Lokpal bill. He was saying that we should have a Lokpal bill and that is something his anti-corruption movement was like it uh, in a way it brought the issue of corruption once again into limelight and it started in the year 2011 so now it is 12 years already that this movement took place he started it as a hunger strike on 5th april and eventually it was joined by protesters in large number anna's movement was also named as jan lokpal andolan jan lokpal andolan because it was aiming at a lokpal bill in english we also call it india against corruption campaign iac cam campaign so india against corruption because with that title it was joined by people from worldwide and the slogan that was given was mai bhi anna and everyone was joining that movement and uh, I remember that during those days in Delhi uh, this kind of a mask was distributed which had Anna's face and everyone was putting that and saying Mai bhi Anna. So irrespective of your ideological inclination it was the idea of corruption which united the middle class. So for 12 days he sat on hunger strike and the government agreed to compose the Lokpal bill. Hazare was still unhappy with the government's decision and it announced that he will again sit on strike another fast on 16th of August. When Anna refused to stop his strike, he was arrested. Afterwards, the team behind Anna Hajare split due to internal differences. So what happened is that there was a crack in the movement. The, the movement got divided into two parts. One part was led by Arvind Kejriwal now which led to the formation of Aam Admi Party and Anna Hajare decided to remain non-political. He said that he doesn't have any political interest. He doesn't want to become a political leader in that sense. So we find that it was Anna movement which led to the formation of Aam Admi Party. So this part I have mentioned as splitting of team Anna. So team Anna and its members failed to convince the Indian government to pass the Lokpal bill. The cracks appeared in team Anna due to political perspectives. So now if the group will have two different ways of looking at the things, their interests differed. So that way one group became with Arvind Kejriwal who felt that we need to carry forward this demand as with a political interest. So uh, Arvind Kejriwal agreed to join the politics but Anna Hajare decided to remain non-political. So th that way Aam Admi Party came into uh, being, Aam Admi Party was formed. Now again what happened is that though Anna again came into la limelight in 2013 to convince the government again to pass the Lokpal bill. This time Anna Hajare's movement went along with the banner of his new community Janatantra Morcha and finally the Lokpal bill was passed on 17th December in Rajya Sabha and he broke his 12 days fast in the Lok Sabha. So that way it is considered as the success of Anna movement that the Lokpal bill was passed in one house which is Rajya Sabha. Now what all has been the achievements of uh, Anna movement is that first of all it brought the issue of corruption to limelight. Now the, it became the major issue in political conversation so there was this you can say India got this global attention from the worldwide people got to know through Anna movement that corruption is a major problem. Then some major scams came into limelight. For instance, the 2G scam, 2G, 3G scam you must have heard of. The spectrum allocation case it is called. Now companies will find it tough to benefit from corruption due to the Lokpal bill. So even the right to information has played an important role now that we have RTI, people can ask for uh, the details of whatever money has been allocated by the government. So this slogan uh, I already mentioned to you about Mabhi Anna, so here I will not talk about it. In Karnataka, one of the countries 
fastest developing states a lokpal inquiry a corrupt nexus between politicians and corporations and that led to resignation by uh, one chief minister so sometimes if the nexus between politicians and a uh, corporation is so high then it may lead to the political uh, loss of any leader similarly as we saw that uh, anna movement got divided into two parts so that way this fight against corruption was something which weakened but its success was the implementation of the lokpal bill then what another thing that happened is that one of the achievements is that a new party came up which which is like it it has high hopes uh, from middle class so aam aadmi party became a party um, which is against corruption and the middle class became its largest you can say uh, uh, they are loyal towards aam aadmi party so delhi is was the first state where it came into government and then even in punjab it has done fairly well so these are some of the measures which are taken to curb corruption so so far you see that from uh, 1980s onwards in india when we gradually moved toward towards liberalization of in, in the indian economy that you see that first there was this act prevention of corruption act that came in 1988 second was the central vigilance commission act which came in 2003 third is the right to information act which came in 2005 right to information act is an important step to uh, fight corruption at especially when it comes to decentralization then there was this whistle blower protection act 2014 so now what happens is that sometimes if something goes wrong then people can even uh, file a case then maybe you would have heard of public interest litigation that pil can be issued and people can complain regarding any case and and such cases are also carried forward in the courts then there is this lokpal and lokayukt act in 2013 which was one of the major achievements of anna andolan then there are e governance initiatives now in e governance initiatives most of the government documents whatever the rules and regulations are made they are available in public domain people can easily visit the government websites to get to know about any recent act which has been passed or what kind of uh, entitlements are there for the people the last point that i have uh, mention in a short form is lpg and gst lpg is for liberalization privatization and globalization and gst is goods and services tax now why have i mentioned these two is because by liberalization privatization and globalization we have opened up the indian economy that means we have adopted the free economy now and uh, now indian market is open for the goods produced worldwide so in that sense no more india can shut its door it cannot say that it will not sell the things which are produced outside so in globalization we say that entire world becomes part of the global economy so you can send your things to other countries to sell similarly you have to sell the things which are produced in other countries that leads to competitiveness so your products should be good then only it will last in the global markets so for example and that is also regarding the fruits and vegetables so the apples which are produced in india are sometimes in europe they are said that it doesn't match the standard and then they say that we uh, we don't want to buy indian apples so for everything all the production from your uh, fruits and vegetables to even say uh, electronic goods you have to match the standard 
which is the global standard. So that is something which we have to understand that in liberalization, privatization and globalization, we have to understand that the economy has to be open for all the markets. And in goods and services tax, people know that whatever they purchase, a certain amount of tax goes to the government. So earlier what used to happen that if you do not take a bill, now taking a bill has become in a way a must and uh, for everything that a shop is selling, it has to produce the bills. So whatever we buy, as some buying something of say as less as just 5 rupees or 10 rupees, then also the shopkeeper gives us a bill. Because now goods and services tax has brought a kind of transparency in the system. So these are some of the measures that I mentioned how we are gradually moving towards such a system that we are ready to fight corruption. So with that now I come to end this lecture with this last slide on uh, which I have titled as conclusion. So this lecture has told you enough about the everydayness of corruption that corruption is so prevalent in India. We come across corruption in every sector at every level in government in the country sometimes large or sometimes little so the amount may vary but corruption is all around. Then people in the private as well as public sector everywhere we see that there are corrupt methods and there are unfair means and that leads to a kind of difficult situation in the society. So this has led to people why such things happen is that people have this desire to make money and this desire to make a lot of money in less time is that leads to corruption. And thus we come across huge scams. You must have heard of Chara Ghotala, the fodder scam. So in the fodder scam in Bihar and the spectrum allocation scam. So in the recent years, in last 10 to 15 years, we have come across numerous such cases where the scams have happened and uh, that has in a way uh, that that is considered as a dent on the image of India as a country. So in order to have an image of a country which is considered as a good country the, in terms of ethics, we need to uh, have a corruption free country. So uh, that is the end of the lecture and here I have mentioned some of the references which you may read. This article by Ramchandra Guha is on JP. This uh, another article by Soni Mishra, it is on 10 years of Anna Andolan that will tell you what all were the major achievements of Anna Andolan. Then you can also read about criminalization in Indian politics. So hopefully you will enjoy doing some of these readings and uh, the, this was the last lecture of this course and with that this course comes to an end. And in case you have any difficulty, you can write an email to me. My email ID is jnuruchi at the rate of gmail.com. In case of any difficulty in any of the lectures that I have given in this course, you may write an email to me and I will happily respond to that. So thank you so much. Thank you. Hello and welcome to this piece of literary snippet. We usually know William Shakespeare as the most revered figure in the history of English literature. But we often tend to forget that he has also been one of the most hated figures in literature. And here I am not talking only about those boys and girls who have to memorize uh, long sections from Macbeth or King Lear or Julius Caesar uh, before they can go and sit for their school and, or college exams. But I am also talking about people who are themselves quite famous authors. Tolstoy, for instance, considered the writings of Shakespeare to be, and I quote, crude, 
immoral, vulgar and senseless. George Bernard Shaw absolutely loathed Shakespeare as he did Homer. But perhaps no other criticism about Shakespeare is more damaging than the one which says that Shakespeare is a marvelous storyteller, provided someone has told him the story earlier. Now, this piece of criticism is particularly damaging because it is true. None of Shakespeare's plays contain any original story whatsoever. They are all written using pre-existing materials, pre-existing stories. Now, does that diminish the stature of Shakespeare as a dramatist? Well, I'll leave that for you to decide. See you in the next episode of Literary Snippets.